He quoted Rupel as saying he was under pressure by his bosses to, or his former bosses at the time, to basically tear down UFOs, be more skeptical of it. What do you think of that? Well, there's no question that the Air Force was not pleased with Rubel's book. It was far more open to the possibility that UFOs are real than the Air Force wanted. And in fact, a few years later, the later head of Project Blue Book just tore Rupel apart in a book that he wrote called Flying Saucers and the U.S. Air Force. So yes, I'm sure that Rupel was under pressure, but I think that as, as we get from his biographer, Wendy Connors and Michael Hall, uh, Rupel was not really ever really a strong UFO proponent. Do we think then maybe Kehoe was putting a spin on this? Was Kehoe that kind of well, person who put there, spins I think on there things? Was, well, there was certainly truth in that. It was obvious that the Air Force was unhappy. The Air Force was publicly unhappy with Ruppelt. And uh, I think that the Air Force really wanted him to make a clear anti-UFO statement. The, in that sense, there was pressure. But I don't think that it was pressure to force Ruppelt to say something that he didn't believe on some level. Okay, so in that sense, he basically gave you what his real viewpoint was, not something that was sugar-coated or forced upon him. That's, I think, the most reasonable reading. I mean, I'm, I'm not reading his mind, but just from my understanding and from the biography of Ruppelt uh, that uh, Connors and Hall wrote, that this seems to be the most reasonable interpretation. Okay, so you read the book, Report on UFOs, a pretty straightforward presentation. Now, you're a young guy. Where do you go from there to pursue your interest? Well, I subscribed to Fate magazine in, in about 1960, 1961, which introduced me to the kind of subculture of UFO buffs. In those days, as you remember well, Gene, there were a subculture specifically of teenage UFO buffs, and they published teenage UFO publications and teenage UFO organizations. I don't think anything like that exists anymore, but there was a thriving scene. In fact, my, my friend David Halperin, um, just next month is coming out with a book, a novel based on his experience as a teenage UFO buff. I wonder what he'll say about me. <laughs> well, I'm waiting for my copy of the book. It's called, I think it's called Journal of a UFO Investigator or something like that. And it's supposed to be pretty good. But anyway, um, then I began to get books through Interlibrary Loan, which introduced me to the books of Charles Fort, which probably in the long span of things, proved to be a greater influence on me even than Rupel was. Because Ford had a larger kind of view of the of anomalies generally and, and really put sightings of UFO-like objects into the broad context of other kinds of unexplained phenomena that, that also interested me, not so much psychic phenomena, but things like falls in the sky, cryptozoological animals, and that sort of thing. Did you at all feel at that point that UFOs and the rest of these things were related or what? Um, they were related in being puzzling, uh, hard to explain. You know, it wasn't easy to particularly see a connection between a report of a lake monster and a report of a UFO, and I still don't really see that connection. <laughs> but it was just interesting to, to be open to a world of strange things, made the world seem much more lively and and engaging than the little life I was living in a small town in Minnesota. Now, at the time you and I got together, at that point you didn't have more of a paranormal slant to the UFO mystery. How did that take place? How did that reflect itself? I don't think that's true, Gene. I remember, I pretty much thought like uh, Donald Kehoe, except that I was also interested in other stuff. But where UFOs are concerned, I thought and, and continue to think that the core phenomenon is probably extraterrestrial in origin. And um, I think if you go back to Kehoe's books, which were published mostly in the 1950s, they concentrated on the kinds of sightings that pilots and Air Force officers and police men and people like that were making. So sort of these solid reports of daylight disks that showed up on radar. And that is still the core of the UFO phenomenon. And that's what was, Kehoe was interested in. And, he, and Kehoe was also an avid reader of popular astronomy. So he was connecting these reports with the state-of-the-art 
scientific speculation about life on other planets. And even in the 1950s, many astronomers thought that there could be intelligent life on Mars and even Venus. Sure, that's one thing, too, Kehoe, in his books, was speculating on the possibility of Mars, Martian UFOs, the canals, all that stuff, things that we learned later were not quite that way. Even the early contactees, you know, the space beings right. they met came from Venus or Mars. But, of course, we didn't know that Venus was a hothouse, so those individuals would have to live in a pretty strange climate. But we understand that he was just basically mirroring what he was reading at the time. Well, even Donald Kehoe, I mean, excuse me, Donald Menzel, who was the major UFO skeptic at the time and a Harvard University astronomer, believed that Mars, that, that Venus consisted of a gigantic ocean with mermaid-like beings in it. So even... You know, straight UFO skeptical scientists had some pretty extreme and exotic ideas about neighboring planets. No, that was Donald Menzel thought that? Yeah. That's news to me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That figure. Yeah, isn't that strange? It's really ironic. I, to me, it's hilarious. Yeah. I also love those do crazy pictures that he drew that Jim Mosley bought, those paintings of space beings. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, those were kind of out of his imagination, as were the mermaids of Venus, but he did propose that. Mermaids then, from Venus, I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> the inspiration for the movie Splash? I don't think so. Jerome Clark joins us, UFO historian. Our co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. Are you wondering about your retirement portfolio? Are you confident that the financial advisor is experienced enough to combat climbing interest rates, taxes, and inflation? Stop guessing and go to the expert, Robert Chapman of the International Forecaster. When you subscribe to the International Forecaster, you get Robert Chapman's 45 years of experience and concise investment recommendations. Who needs sugar-coated excuses when you can get the cold hard facts and proven investment leads you can't get anywhere else? For a free introductory copy to Robert Chapman's International Forecaster, Subscribe now at the internationalforecaster.com or call 877-479-8178. Experience the difference. When you subscribe, you can email Robert Chapman directly to obtain investment advice tailored just for you. Don't wait another minute. Subscribe today at the internationalforecaster.com or call 877-479-8178. That's 877-479-8178. Becoming a modern smoker is now easier and more cost-effective, thanks to LeSig. Traditional smokers the world over love LeSig. E-cigarettes with a look, feel, and taste of real cigarettes, but without the nasty smoke, ashes, or stains. LeSig is powered by revolutionary microelectronic technology. A small, rechargeable battery and unique replaceable cartridge provide all the satisfaction and benefits of smoking without the smoke and all the hazards. See the large variety of LeSig e-cigarette supplies and accessories at LeSig.com. That's L-E-C-I. LeSig is competitively priced, comes with the best customer service, a 30-day warranty, and satisfaction guaranteed. What a great gift idea. For a 10% discount, mention GCN when you call 870-518-4307. That's 870-518-4307. Ask for fast, free, same-day shipping. Order online at LeSig.com and use promo code GCN at checkout. That's L-E-C-I-G.com. LeSig, for today's modern smoker. 
Did you know that drinking pure, high alkaline water is one of the most important factors in maintaining high energy and vibrant health? Most experts agree that the water you drink should be at a pH level of 8 or higher. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops, available only at AlkaVision.com, combine a unique formula of only the most alkaline minerals. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops alkalize your water, ridding the body of harmful toxins, and helps you regain health and energy. Alkalizing your water by simply adding 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops helps Helps the body rid itself of acidic waste, increases oxygen content, and raises the pH of your body to healthy levels. And bacteria and viruses cannot survive in an alkaline high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops for only $29.95 at AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. On air, online, and on demand, we are the GCN Radio Network. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Get in on all the action at forum.theparacast.com. Jerry Clark joining us. Chris O'Brien is the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Now, if we believe certain documents that came to light in the 1980s, the so-called MJ-12 documents, and of course we're going to want to hear your viewpoint about that, Donald Menzel, of course, having worked allegedly in intelligence in World War II, was still basically presenting the side of himself as the UFO skeptic. That was a pose. He was part of MJ-12. Is that all a big, colossal joke? Well, I think the the allegation is. In fact, I think that whoever forged the MJ-12 document put that in as a conscious joke, never realizing that somebody, we're talking here about Stan Friedman, would run with it. And I, I don't believe for a second that Menzel was anything other than a man who was deeply skeptical of UFO reports, almost fanatically so. I saw him on a TV show called Open Minds in the 1960s. He was on with a couple of UFO authors, and the man went almost apoplectic. He had a near yeah. nervous breakdown, screaming about UFOs and they're not being real. Yes, uh, according to Alan Hynek, who knew Menzel well as an astronomical colleague, Menzel was really a, a very, a really a highly overbearing sort of individual who couldn't stand to lose or to be disagreed with. And his behavior on UFO matters was pretty consistent with his character. And he was really a fanatic who would go to any length to disprove a UFO report, even if he had to make stuff up. Menzel was not a good, really a good guy in, in, in the sense of making it possible for scientists to examine UFO data. If any one scientist could be said to have killed scientific curiosity about UFOs, it's Menzel. Now, after that, of course, we had Phil Klass. Maybe more personable, but still the same attitude. Klass, of course, wasn't a scientist, and uh, he had no scientific credentials. His education was in engineering, and he was he was not really scientifically sophisticated in the way that Menzel was. For example, Klass's, Philip Klass's first book, UFOs Identified, where he proposes this idea of giant plasmas as uh, the cause of UFO reports, was ridiculed even in the Condon Report, which was otherwise skeptical of UFOs, and was essentially treated as a work of pseudoscience. And um, after that, after the drubbing he took, class moved from thinking that UFOs actually had an anomalous origin, and giant plasma certainly would have been anomalous. He went on to a more traditional debunking posture where UFOs are hoaxes or mistakes and the people who claim otherwise are are shady characters. And and since a lot of people, since you know, elite opinion wanted to hear that, Glass had quite a successful career until his death as a UFO debunker. He was the guy that the TV talk shows, they need to have a fair and balanced presentation. So you bring on a skeptic like a Phil Class, because then you can bring on the believer and say you're being fair to both sides. Right. 
Yeah, he Glass was an important figure in the culture and in the discussion about UFOs, but he wasn't Menzel. Menzel really played a very special role. And I can understand why somebody would think that, well, maybe he was really up to something other than what he appeared to be up to, which was a sincere rejection of the UFO phenomenon. But what we saw of Menzel as a UFO debunker was from all accounts entirely consistent with his personality. Any possibility he was put up to doing that by the authorities and the government, or he just did it on his own accord? Well, Project Blue Book under Ruppelt, and Ruppelt headed Blue, Blue Book from late 1951 till um, early to mid-1954, thought that Menzel's explanations were nonsensical, and this was opinion widely shared within the Air Force UFO project and those other military people who had some association with it. And they rejected Menzel's effort to take their reports and explain them for them. And, and Menzel made this offer. Menzel was disliked. He was considered not an honest man, and his explanations were rejected by the Blue Book scientists. But after Ruppelt left and, and Blue Book became the public relations debunking operation that it was until it closed in 1969, the Air Force was working with Menzel. They decided that, they, that their quarrel with Menzel was much less than any quarrel they had with UFO proponents. And so Menzel was given access to Air Force UFO reports and his explanations were, you know, were accepted. Anything to basically pour cold water on the whole thing. Right. Yeah. It was just the, the the idea seemed to be that since UFOs are nonsense, any explanation, even if it isn't strictly true, will do. But that right. takes us to what's going on on the other side. Major Kehoe speaks of a silence group, a group of people, individuals within the government who are covering up UFOs. So do you think there was ever such an organization or they just wanted to wash their hands of the entire affair? Well, I don't really know. I mean, this is something, of course, that everybody wonders about. And um, and there are, you know, there's some circumstantial evidence that there was a group that took UFO sightings more seriously than the Project Blue Book seemed to be doing. And um, I just don't know. It, it, it's hard for me to believe that you could have really puzzling reports, radar visual reports, sightings by pilots and Air Force people and military personnel of clearly structured, you know, machine looking objects performing, you know, extraordinarily and um, defying interceptions from our aircraft and not think that there was something of national security implication going on. And so I don't think it's it's unreasonable to think that there was some group that at least very closely monitored sightings in sensitive places like military bases and atomic installations and so on. But it's very hard to prove that there was any such group. And if there was, what conclusions it came to. The most interesting speculation in this regard is in Leslie Keene's recent book, where she finds a document of undeniable provenance that suggests that within the government there is a kind of small off-the-books agency, which meets periodically to study really puzzling UFO reports with national security implications and takes them seriously but that you could never find if you looked through a list of government agencies. So this is something that's off the books in many ways. Of course, doing things off the books, I guess that's normal for the U.S. government, wasn't it? Donald well, Rumsfeld, who was talking about, what, $2.2 trillion of money that had not been accounted for? Hmm. Well, there's a lot of that that's going on. There's no question that there's off the books stuff going on in the government. And that's probably where you would find the so-called silence group. Sounds but how weird. active it is, it may be more passive in having an analytical function rather than a function going around and threatening UFO witnesses. And a reminder, if you want to get involved and participate in our discussions, join our forums, forum.powercast.com. That's forum.powercast.com. All you have to do to sign up is give yourself a unique username, such as the greatest UFO fan in the world. No, I think that's taken. Check it out, forum.paracast.com. We'll get back with more with Jerome Clark. Our co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the, the Paracast. Paracast. 
Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack! Attack! Of the Rockwells. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans a galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack, Attack of the Rockoids is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack, Attack. Of the Rockwell, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. This message starts with a great offer from Big Berkey Water Filters because we don't want you drinking dangerous water one minute longer. Right now, purchase any filter system from BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com to get your choice of two Berkey Sport bottles, a KDF shower filter, a set of fluoride filters, or our new Sight Glass spigot absolutely free. Why do this? Because over 60% of municipal water is fluoridated, and at less than two cents per gallon, Berkey Water Filters purify both treated and untreated water, removing dangerous chlorine, fluoride, and other contaminants. Big Berkey water filters are powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water, so they're perfect for rainwater collection systems and emergency preparedness. Remember, Big Berkey includes free shipping on every order over $50. And GCN listeners get 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit B-I-G-B-E-R-K-E-Y waterfilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's Big Berkey waterfilters.com or call today 1-877-99-BERKEY. Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at crossbreedholsters.com. Don't forget, crossbreedholsters.com. If you're serious about playing college football, give yourself the competitive edge with the National Underclassmen Football Combine. The NUC is the longest-running underclassmen event and the most respected combine and football camp in the nation, specifically designed to give athletes early recruiting exposure. There's no better time than now to compete in the National Underclassmen Football Combine. Call 888-NUC-MVP1 or go to nationalunderclassmen.com to find out more. This is Alex Jones with five good reasons you should consider buying a solar power generator. Number one, new climate legislation could easily double or triple your electric bill. Number two, our new energy czar wants to control how much power your electric company allows you to have. It's true. Total government control of electricity in the name of smart grid technology is coming. Number three, in some areas of the country, the power grid is dangerously overloaded. And now new socialist legislation is only compounding the problem. Number four, dangerous weather is always a threat to local grids. Every year, thousands of families lose their power from weather-related outages. Number five, a solar power generator provides powerful backup insurance and peace of mind. Folks, I really believe in the solar power generators offered by Solutions from Science, one of my oldest sponsors. You can get more information at www.mysolarbackup.com. That's mysolarbackup.com. Remember, the government doesn't own the sun, so go to MySolarBackup.com or call 1-877-327-0365. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. This is Jim Mosley, editor of Saucer Smear, and I'm here to say a good word or two about the Paracast, which I believe is the gold standard of paranormal radio. Listen to it if you can. We're back with Jerome Clark, UFO historian. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the PowerCast. Chris, would you pursue the questioning? Yeah, uh, Jerry, I just, I'm just i very intrigued by uh, a new book that Nick Redfern just uh, had published a couple of months back called Final Events. 
And in that book, he mentions a group that's been dubbed the Collins Elite, I guess, for convenience, that that has been uh, fairly active, but low key and behind the scenes, um, looking into the UFO phenomenon. And they determine that it's it's something uh, of of a demonic nature that that uh, we're not really dealing with extraterrestrials as much as we're dealing with demons. Uh, are you aware of, of, of this book, number one? And number two, what do you think of that? Of that? <laughs> Pretty interesting uh, take on this whole thing. I have the book. I haven't read it yet. I, I do read most of Nick's books, and I, have, I respect him. He's a conscientious, hardworking guy. And I don't say that in, in any condescending way because I, I don't want to give you the impression that when I say what I'm about to say, I'm putting it off on Nick. If 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 he, that's what he's found, I'll, I'll read what he's found. But no, I don't. I certainly don't believe UFOs are demonic. And you have to remember that even within the United States government, you know, there are some very very you know religious people with really kind of fundamentalist views, and that's where that sort of thing would show up where you know a kind of uh, fundamentalist theology would intersect with anomalies and and they always conclude that they're demonic that just it seems to be the the de facto conclusion no I, I certainly don't take that theory seriously if theory is even the word for it <laughs> well and some of the information that he puts in there is is, is pretty interesting and it, it does it does make you wonder um, how people can uh, when they're, I think it's human nature. When you're when you're faced with something unknown, you tend to to revert to basic primal thinking. I think. Oh, absolutely, and, absolutely. Yeah, and that's uh, I, I do recommend uh, I do recommend that book for people that are looking for interesting out of the box uh, <laughs> theories on on the phenomenon. But where do you see uh, where do you see the involvement in the government? In let's say in behind the scenes in in let's say UFO groups. Um, monitoring the actual um, cultural side of this as opposed to the science and the and the actual reports and what have you. Obviously, during the Cold War, the government was probably interested uh, in UFO groups uh, because of the possible inf infiltration uh, by Eastern Bloc countries. But do you see uh, the government having a, a very active role, let's say, in the, in the demise of NICAP or in some of the uh, the interesting scenarios that have played out over the years? Well, I think that NICAP was probably the only group in UFO history that actually posed something of a threat to official UFO policy, because NICAP had all these, you know, retired admirals and generals and, uh, you know, high rank former CIA people and so on on its board of governors. And it was located in Washington. Donald Keogh, who was the head of NICAP, had all kinds of, you know, official contacts within the government and within Congress because of his long history is on the, at the Pentagon desk office. So the the Air Force really did not like NICAP. But when I was working on my encyclopedia during the 1990s, I got access to the NICAP files. And I was particularly interested in the documents relating to NICAP's demise, according to a widespread legend, the CIA infiltrated NICAP and destroyed it. The documents, the internal documents, do not provide any evidence for that conclusion. What happened was basically Kehoe mismanaged the organization. Kehoe did not have managerial skills, did not know how to handle money, and there were all kinds of problems. And at one point, J.B. Hartramp, who was a member of the board and who was the head of the, I can't remember exactly the name of it, but it was like the Private Pilots Association of America. That's not, not exactly it, but close enough. And uh, Hartramp was a wealthy guy, like a lot of these guys were. And he began going through the NICAP rules and discovered that if the organization collapsed, he and his rich buddies were going to be financially responsible. And Hartraff just about went ballistic. And when he learned that, that he was going to, that when NICAP fell apart, he was, it was going to cost him a lot of money. He began organizing the board and telling them they had to get rid of Kehoe. And that's what happened. It's just sort of a, you know, has to do more with economics and government secrecy. 
and they put somebody in charge who had some kind of CIA background, which probably wasn't that unusual in, in Washington at that time. A guy who didn't know a lot about UFOs, but who had some organizational skills and wasn't going to drive the organization to the ground and cost these guys on the board a lot of their own money. And that's basically the story of NICAP's collapse. I know that that some, that this this legend about the CIA collapsing organization, I just don't. I just simply didn't find any evidence for it. Now, during a lot of those years, Richard Hall was the day-to-day -day manager of NICAP. I mean, I visited them a couple of times in the sixth season. Keel wasn't there. He was seldom there. He'd come in maybe That's right. once or twice a week. So Hall did the day-to-day -day work. So do we blame the late Richard Hall for some of NICAP's lapses at the time? In the documents that I saw, Hall's name didn't come up. It was Keel's name. Keel was the guy who was causing all the alarm and generating the criticism. Dick Hall was, I think, probably more competent in that way than Keel was. And I think that to the extent that NICAP was effective on a day-to-day -day basis, and it was remarkably effective in a lot of ways, the the investigations, the field investigations that NICAP conducted are just marvels. They're models of how UFO investigations should be conducted. And you can't really appreciate that unless you actually see those files and read what's in them. In some of the cases that I discuss in my UFO encyclopedia, they're based almost entirely on the NICAP field investigations, which were so thorough that it was just astonishing. Now, Kehoe wasn't participating in these, but Dick Hall was overseeing this and interacting with the heads of the various subcommittees that were conducting the field investigations. So I think Dick Hall is one of the unheralded heroes of the, of the story and, and, and of ufology generally. Well, I know that I had some run-ins with Richard Hall at the time because he could be kind of an irascible person. Yes, we, he was. He was a good friend of mine, but yes, he was irascible. And sometimes I was at the receiving end of that, even as his good friend. Okay, so we look at NICAP then, therefore, we can't say that NICAP, even though it was heavily laden on his board with former military officers, that it was really a front. Because that was one of the other theories about NICAP at the time, that NICAP was a front for the CIA or some other organization designed to, again, mislead people about UFOs or point them in the wrong direction. But what you saw didn't indicate that. Do you think that maybe there were certain documents that were withheld from you when you checked this? It didn't look like that to me. There was a pretty clear paper trail. Also, the kinds of people that were on the NICAP board were the kinds of people that, that Donald Kehoe knew. They were his natural friends the kinds of people that he socialized with, you know, conservative military people. And that describes Kehoe, retired military people. These were, the, these were his pals. It wasn't that they came out of the woodwork and forced themselves on him. These are people that, for the most part, he knew pretty well. The people he most felt that he trusted that would be willing to go out on the limb and admit that there's a possibility that UFOs existed. It all sounded pretty good, although I got the impression, too, at the time as a member of NICAP, I was a member of NICAP at the time, a card-carrying member. They could never get their newsletter out on time. Kehoe was always putting this public appeals. We need donations. We need financing. So it is possible it's not just mismanagement then, but maybe they just couldn't get enough money to keep it going properly. We'll get into more of that in a moment. UFO historian Jerry Clark joining us. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO 
at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. All types of batteries for all types of gadgets. We'll say it again. All types of batteries for For all all types types of of gadgets. gadgets. Electronics, toys, flashlights, computers, accessories, and more are at BatteryStation.com. Whatever type battery you need, alkaline, lithium, gel cell, NICAT, metal hydride, sealed lead acid, and more are at BatteryStation.com. Our homepage gives you quick access to ham, marine, police, fire, and aviation batteries. Plus, choose from our great selection of LED flashlights with no bulb to ever burn out and much longer battery life. Find many top brands, including Streamlight, Pelican, Surefire, Novatac, Gerber, and more at BatteryStation.com. You'll also find the most popular brands of ammunition and watertight cases for storing guns, food, electronics, survival gear, and more at BatteryStation.com. Call 417-257-7799. That's 417-257-7799. You will be surprised when you visit BatteryStation.com. In a coming-apart world, you need something to keep it tied together. That something is Atwood Rope, the highest quality rope made in the USA from exotic braids for military, rescue, arborists, shipyards, tow line, or boating. Quality rope at affordable prices you and your customers can depend on. Find a dealer or shop online at atwoodrope.net. Enter promo code RADIO to receive 100 feet of 550 paracord free with purchase. Atwood Rope, working to keep the world tied together. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Men, take control of your prostate health without the risk of nasty side effects with Prostate Secure. Early detection, regular prostate exams, and PSA tests are a must for men over 40. Listen, if you have symptoms of an enlarged prostate but don't want to take a drug with possible nasty side effects, or if you're over 40, then use Prostate Secure, a natural dietary supplement for men. Prostate Secure is a scientifically formulated blend of clinically significant amounts of natural ingredients. It brings together the most powerful plant sterols like beta cytosterol and saw palmetto, along with antioxidants such as vitamin D3, resveratrol, and lycopene to support good prostate health, proper urinary flow, function, and more. Check out ProstateSecure.com. Order online and save 10% with promo code SAVE10 or call 1-800-239-9432. That's 800-239-9432. Or visit ProstateSecure.com. Take control of your prostate health naturally with Prostate Secure. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. This is the Paracast. You never know what's going to happen next. We return with Jerome Clark. The book he's talking about is this UFO history book. Tell us more about it before we go into more details about NICAP and other organizations. Well, during the 1990s, I did a multi-volume UFO encyclopedia for the reference house Omnigraphics. And that multi-volume series, which actually was was in two editions, the second of which, which is the definitive one, was published in 1998, is really the probably the most the fullest history of the UFO controversy that is seen print anywhere, and uh, I spent years working on it and had access to all kinds of materials that hadn't seen print before. So it's it's a perspective that's based on a lot of original research and primary documents and interviews and so on. So there's a lot of things in there that that people don't know or that or that correct or extend the record. And, uh, you know, it's really kind of my life's work. My most recent book, which came out in um, this summer, is called Hidden Realms, uh, Lost Civilizations, and Beings from Other Worlds is, uh, is an overview of the wilder side of everything, <laughs> the Shaver mystery and uh, 
things like that. Let's briefly segue to the wilder side, the wild woolly side of UFOs, the Shaver mystery, stuff like that. Now, obviously, there are attractions to the kind of things that Shaver talked about, and you and I both knew Shaver, so we have some personal knowledge of this. But are there things we should mention about people like Shaver, maybe in connection with that Ray Palmer, that would illuminate more their point of view or why they came to those conclusions? I want to say one thing. Um, I, I did not know Shaver personally, unlike you. And I want to also say that the interview that you did with Shaver that you published years ago is probably the single most illuminating interview with the man that I've ever read, and I've often had occasion to go back to it and cite it. I'm surprised. Thank you. This was published like in the early 1970s, where my first wife, Geneva, and I took a drive out to some place in rural Arkansas, found this cottage with Richard Shaver and his wife, Dorothy, personable people. And the thing I liked about him is I had a brief interview, and I said, you know, anything you want to add? And he says, no, I just want to go get a cigarette. Hmm. Well, I, I, I found that incredibly illuminating interview. Maybe you just happened to ask in that brief time all the right questions, and Shaver was being unusually frank. What are the things that we take away from Richard Shaver about his contribution or lack thereof to UFO research? I don't think he made any contribution to UFO research, but I think that he made a contribution to the kind of folklore and culture of the otherworldly. And I think that there's another kind of distinction seldom remarked on, but really needs to be stressed. Most people who talk about visionary experiences are kind of visionary scenarios of a larger, stranger other world are perfectly sincere and mentally well, you know, in, in contrast to the standard that, well, if you think that or claim that this happened to you, you experienced that, you must be a nut. Well, actually, there's a fair amount of, um, you know, scholarly and psychiatric writing on the subject, and people who have otherworldly visions aren't necessarily mentally ill. In fact, there's some evidence that actually some of them are better off than the rest of us. But I do believe that Shaver's visions grew out of clinical mental illness and that he did spend a lot of time in mental institutions. And I think that if Shaver hadn't connected with Ray Palmer, who, as you know, was an incredible promoter of all kinds of outlandish things, we wouldn't be talking about Shaver. He would have just been another crazy person. Well, Palmer said in the interview I did with him, he revealed, you know, Shaver was in a mental institution. And, of course, Shaver became very incensed over this. But the point being that Palmer knew what to say and how to say it. Do we believe Palmer? Palmer claimed he was at one point harassed by alleged men in black or under-earth beings or something like that. Well, Palmer tells one story, which he stuck with over the years. And that was that when he first went out to visit Shaver in Pennsylvania, which would have been probably in early 1945. He doesn't date this, but that's as near as I can trace it. He claims that he heard voices talking about torturing a young woman. And of course, the demonic entities that Shaver talked about were really basically sadistic idiots called Deros. And so Palmer claimed that he heard all these voices while he was in the bedroom late at night at the Shaver residence, and he said that it was impossible for Shaver to have faked all these voices. And um, and Palmer carried this story forward for years, and he was repeating it even close to the end of his life. And this was the source for his alleged belief that there was something to what Shaver was saying. The problem is, I worked, as you know, for many years for Fate magazine, and I knew Kurt and Mary Fuller very well. And they had co-founded Fate with Palmer, and they'd known him years before because they both worked for Ziff Davis Publishing in Chicago. And I often asked them about Palmer and Shaver and so on. And they said that, that although they thought that Shaver was a, really a personable guy, they thought that he was like a mental case, literally, you know, not figuratively. 
And they also said consistently about Palmer that it was just simply impossible ever to tell what Palmer believed about anything. And so that anything that Shaver, that, that Palmer said, they tended to view, shall we say, cautiously. So basically, was Palmer just making <laughs> up a lot of these things just to sell magazines? Is that also a problem they had in relating with him? Is that why he split from the Fullers? What's the answer? Th- that was one reason. They had trouble. In the early years of Fate magazine, Mary Fuller suffered from tuberculosis. And the Fullers had these small children. And Kurt Fuller was also the editor of Flying Magazine. So Kurt was extremely busy raising these little small children, working as an editor, and, and taking care of his wife. So the magazine in the early years was run almost exclusively by Palmer. So there's all kinds of content in those early years, some of which actually still survives in fringe literature, that may actually have been Palmer written fiction. And the Fullers told me that they could never really tell because the records were scarce and they couldn't believe what Palmer told them. So if, as you read those wonderful early issues of Fate, um, there wasn't really any control over the factual content. So Palmer, I think, you know, human beings are complicated. You can't just summarize a whole life or a whole personality in a single sentence unless you're dealing with some extremely dull individual. But Palmer, I think, was even more complex than most people. And that there were things, I think, I suspect, that he genuinely believed. But whether he believed them or not, they were all subject for exploitation. And it didn't matter whether he found it credible or not. If, if, he, could, if he could exploit it and make yeah. money... P.T. Palmer. <laughs> he, was, he was like a carnival barker. That's yeah, what I compare like, him to. P.T. Barnum. Yeah. Some, some people talk of Gray Barker in that fashion. Oh, Gray Barker's idol was Ray Palmer. Yes, we know that, yeah. I assume you guys have seen that excellent documentary film, Shades of Gray, done about Barker's life. Yes, we did an episode about it, and I did get to see it briefly, and of course I knew Barker as you did. So it was interesting what his approach was, but, you know, some of us, like Alan Greenfield, always believe that in the end, Gray Barker had this kernel of belief in UFOs, but ever the showman, he basically focused on the stuff that sounded good, that could potentially sell books, sell magazines, not so much on the hardcore research where he wasn't so concerned. Absolutely. That's, I think, in fact, in the film, I say something in the same. That, yeah, it's it's not hard to be puzzled by UFOs, to think that there's really something strange and, and unknown going on here. But, you know, at some point you begin to realize, you know, there's not much I can do about it. You know, and, and some people just beat their heads forever, like me and you guys. And, and other people just think, hey, I'm going to have fun with it. So you know, I, it, that, that might be part Parker's of the problem, decision. though, in some of the things that are written or broadcast about UFOs is people concentrate on the possibility of taking something like this and say, hey, you know, we can have fun, we can make money, we can really have a good time, and it doesn't so much matter what the UFOs are, what their impact on our civilization might be. We're very much impacted over the years by Jerome Clark, UFO historian. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in The Paracast. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you own an Apple iPhone and love to listen to your favorite programs on GCN, I've got good news for you. I'm proud to announce that GCN has a brand new iPhone app available for our dedicated listeners at GCNlive.com. Listen to your favorite hard-hitting GCN programs live or on demand right on your iPhone. And the best part? The GCN iPhone app can be yours absolutely free. Download the iPhone app today by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this This is 
Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We have Jerome Clark getting into the second hour of the Paracast. It seems so much less when we record these shows, for magical reasons. (laughs) Yeah, but now I know why my head's soft. I've been beating it against a wall. It totally makes sense now. Chris you know, O'Brien, that, that's why Chris O'Brien, up. when he says, the Paracast, he sounds like he's beating his head against the wall. <laughs> oh, no. It doesn't feel like that, Jerry, seriously, or maybe half seriously. As it feels sometimes, you've been involved in the UFO field for so many decades, maybe you're beating your head against the wall that nothing is ever going to be solved. It's just going to go on and on, and your kids and their kids and their grandkids will still be looking into it. Well, I didn't mean to sound quite as cynical. I meant that kind of humorously. I think that what I what I was trying to say more seriously here is that when you start out, you think you are going to be able to solve it. And uh, in fact, what happens over time is that you begin to realize that what's going on is really beyond current knowledge. And if it's ever solved, it's not going to be by you. And the human race itself and science will not solve it until we know more about how the universe works. And so over time, I have developed various ideas. And in the last 15 years or so, I think that I have figured out at least what is going on without explaining it, but at least having some sense of, yes, this is the way it works. Whatever it is, it works like this. And that has given me some satisfaction. So, you know, when I've written my last book and and gone on to wherever lies beyond, I'll have some satisfaction feeling that, yes, I did make intellectual progress with this. Okay, if it's E.T. coming here, E.T. is coming here now and forever for how many years, we don't know, maybe many centuries, doesn't it have to ultimately play out with some kind of connection between us and them? Or will they say, stay forever elusive? Is that part of it that it's destined to be something where UFOs will never be known unless the tables turn? So I think the fundamental problem is kind of expressed in your question. And that is that we just presume without even thinking about it, that when we're talking about UFOs, we're talking about one thing. I think we're probably dealing with at least two things which are not related to each other, except the on a highly superficial level. But they're epistemologically, the, the, we're dealing with two very different things. And what we call the, the UFO phenomenon is defined by you know, Kehoe and, and, the, and the foundational figures of ufology. We're talking about probably a minority of what people experience as UFOs. Now, I'm not talking about identified flying objects or hoaxes or misinterpretations. I'm talking about two great anomalies, of which the lesser is probably extraterrestrial visitors from another solar system. The other, the really, really puzzling, the really high strangeness aspect of this is an experiential phenomenon. The UFO that is arguably extraterrestrial in origin is an event phenomenon. It can be traced on radar, leave puzzling ground traces, you know, basically the core UFO phenomenon you can find demonstrated in Close Encounters of the Second Kind. The high strangest phenomenon, probably something else, and probably an exper- purely an experiential phenomenon, and something related to centuries and centuries of you know, supernatural experience that is really uh, related to some extraordinarily anomalous state of consciousness. And really, so far beyond current knowledge, that we don't even really have a useful vocabulary with which to discuss it. Well, Jerry, is it so your there sense is, of- so, so, so from my point of view, there, there, the event phenomenon is the core phenomenon. 
the experiential phenomenon is the high strangeness aspect, and that exists only in memory and testimony. Well, you you bring up a very interesting point that uh, majority of, of of you know, especially the high strange uh, events are experiential. Now, do you think that this is experiential? With the individual, or it, could there be some sort of collective uh, experiential uh, aspect to to this, or is this purely a an individual experiencing something strange, tapping into something strange, and having it occur to them, or or is it something uh, that could be possibly collective that that we're dealing with something that is manifesting in more than just one person, uh, let's say? Oh, absolutely. That's what makes it so incredibly puzzling. You know, if, it were, if all high strangeness experiences were reported by only one person, and many of them are, but not all of them, obviously, yeah, then we could say, well, we're dealing with some kind of real psychological anomaly. But the fact that these things can be collectively experienced really ratchets up. The, the yeah, but I'm not, I'm obviously, I'm not saying problem. only one person is experiencing all this. What I'm saying is, is this an individuated thing or is it something that could be part of a collective manifestation yeah that's words, what i just said that this yeah. can be a collective experience and that's what makes it so strange and so hard to yeah. explain and because yeah, um, then we get but, into the realm of jung and the collective unconscious and you know no, there's all I sorts of there well there's it's if if you're talking about people you know groups of individuals individuals uh for th the hundreds possibly thousands of years experiencing something high strange and unusual there is, at least in my mind, there is the possibility that something is emerging out of the collective that certain individuals, either by happenstance or by design, happen to be, be the ones to experience these things. So, Have you ever you know, read I, my book, The Unidentified, which was published in 1975, I think? I did many years ago. In fact, it well, was quite a, That was exactly the view expressed in that book, and I don't, I don't accept it anymore. I, okay. I, I think I don't even accept the existence of a collective unconscious. One of Jung's critics famously said, the collective unconscious existed in Jung's library. <laughs> no, I think that, that terms like this don't really mean a lot. W what happens is that there is a, 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 you know, a culturally reflective aspect, which is at the core of the experience anomaly. In other words, a society has its own definition of what an otherworldly encounter is. And the experiences of individuals or small groups of individuals with this other world will reflect the culture's sense of what an otherworldly experience is. And so the nature of the experiences, at least the superficial aspect, the, the experiential aspects, change over time and in, in location and geography. And um, so, you know, there is this kind of you know, there's cultural and social definition of the experience. Oh, absolutely. But the experience itself behind the, the superficial forms is, you know, is, is, I think the stimulus, whatever it is, is the same and remains the same over time. And I think that um, in our own time, our idea of another world experience is encountered with extraterrestrials. And I think that if there are real extraterrestrials visiting here, and if the galaxy is as densely populated as, as many astronomers say it is, that wouldn't be surprising at all. It would be more surprising if they weren't here. But we still have this idea, and that the concept, the, the, the experience anomaly takes off from the image of extraterrestrials because that's our prevailing view of an otherworldly encounter. And there may, at the core of this, be actual encounters with actual extraterrestrials. But the stuff that fall, follows from that, like other world journeys, abductions, men in black, mothman, things like this, I think really draw on much older materials that link them to fairy lore and, and angelic encounters and, and demonic entities that have figured in all of history that, that are real as experiences but apparently not as events that you could ever document. That the experience or anomaly survives only, as I said earlier, in memory and testimony. There's never anything you're going to be able to bring into a laboratory. You're never going to trace it on radar, but it's going to be very real if it happens to you. It's going to feel yeah, make, very make you scratch your head. Well, yeah, it's going to be vivid and, and frightening and startling. Well, how about, how about a scenario like this where you have uh, you know, little grades that are seen pretty much exclusively in the United States 
and then all of a sudden, as as word of these of this particular form or or symbolic sort of image spreads, then all of a sudden, you you're getting reports from further away from the U.S. and and now it's a worldwide sort of almost a uh, <laughs> cliche, if you will. I think uh, we'll have cliches about gray aliens, but we have to do something which does not present a cliche to us. It's a message from our benefactors. We have Jerry Clark. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Hi, this is Tamar from Namecheap. We're a domain name and web hosting company, and we really care about our customers. With domain name purchases, Namecheap offers free SSL and free WhoisGuard for a year to protect your identity from spammers. Most importantly, we care about you. If you'd like to learn more, please visit us at radio.namecheap.com, radio.namecheap.com for web hosting and domain name specials. You can also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash Namecheap or become a fan of ours on Facebook at facebook.com slash Namecheap. See you online. Fate Magazine provides true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. To receive your free issue of Fate Magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits gold it's like nothing else on earth from the romans through the renaissance from the industrial age to the space age gold has weathered the test of time for six thousand years gold has remained the ultimate store of wealth According to the World Gold Council and the U.S. Mint, demand is at an all-time high. The stage is being set for the reemergence of gold as the common-sense alternative to a fiat paper currency that gets weaker every day. Midas Resources is proud to offer the hard-hitting report that arms you with the truth you need to protect you and your family from the Fed's plans for your hard-earned money. Don't gamble with your future. Call Midas Resources today and ask for your free copy of As Good As Gold. Call 1-800-686-223. For the report the Fed hopes you'll never see. As good as gold can be yours by calling 800 686 2237. If you have ever thought about owning gold, you must read this report. Call Midas today at 800 686 2237. If you own a septic system or if you're facing costly septic system replacement, this message is for you. When you want to stop paying for pump outs and avoid backups, when you've had enough of the foul odors and costly repairs, use BioSafe One Septic Solution. Now there's an easy to use 100% guaranteed answer to all your septic system problems. BioSafe One Septic Solution. BioSafe One is patented and made specifically for all septic systems and made by the same team of scientists who help clean up the Exxon Valdez oil spill. BioSafe One decontaminates and removes sludge, stops costly pump outs and repairs and remove septic system stench all with a 100% success rate see what gives biosafe one septic solution the advantage over any other septic product at biosafe one.com that's b-i-o-s-a-f-e-o-n-e.com biosafe one.com or call toll free 1-866-424-6663 that's 1-866-424-6663 biosafe one the guaranteed bio-friendly money-saving way to clean your septic system I'm concerned about food for my family in the event of an emergency, and I know you are too. Are you ready? Don't wait for an emergency to happen. Put a plan together now with quality dehydrated food from Ready Reserve Foods. For nearly 40 years, Ready Reserve Foods has been in continuous operation canning the finest in dehydrated foods. Other companies just broker canned foods. Ready Reserve is the manufacturer controlling quality from start to finish with double enameled cans and nitrogen packing for maximum shelf life. Ready Reserve offers a balanced selection of fruits, vegetables, dairy products, proteins, and grains. Choose from a variety of pre-selected units or order by individual can to customize your own plan. When you purchase from Ready Reserve Foods, you are buying factory direct at wholesale prices. Call today for a free catalog, 1-800-453-2202 or visit readyreservefoods.com. Call 1-800-453-2202. Ready Reserve Foods. Factory direct. Wholesale pricing. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. 
That's news at theparacast.com. And if you want to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out on iTunes. We continue with Jerome Clark, UFO historian. Our co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. And Chris was asking the great question here about the, I guess, the public conscious image of what UFO aliens are. So now it's grays, but the implication, I gather, Chris, is what you're saying is that isn't what they are. It's what we perceive them to be. Well, it seems to me there's a certain aspect of front loading. It's almost like if you expect to see something, if you have an unusual experience, you tend to revert to some sort of uh, primal sort of view of it. And if you're front loaded and, and you're the, the culture, the media has been programming you with a, with a particular image, it seems to me that you would tend to go into that direction to put the details on the experience. So. I think the, 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 the little gray alien is a classic uh, example of that. What do, what do you think, Jerry? Well, I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. I, I, again, it's probably not the whole truth. Little gray aliens were showing up in uh, C3s well before they became a common image in popular culture. But I do agree with you that I think this thing kind of feeds on itself and that you know, somebody's imagined experience or even some genuinely anomalous experience phenomenon is going to build on, you know, on images that are known in the culture that are part of the, the common language of the culture. So, yeah, I think there, there, there's some truth in what you're saying. We wonder why some of these cultural sort of versions of these uh, high strange type phenomena, uh, how they have a, a peculiar kind of a regional or, or subcultural aspect to them. Like, for instance, you tend to see a lot more dark, hairy dwarf slash alien reports from South America as opposed to the types of more clinical gray sort of, you know, small, diminutive, bald, uh, spindly characters that, that have been reported, I think, most often in the United States. But as I pointed out, is now a worldwide thing. What aspect or what uh, element of the culture do you think can program the details of individual experience like that? I mean, what, what is it that makes these particular areas report these particular types of descriptions? One subject of great interest to me, which I've written about at various times, including in my most recent book, Hidden Realms, is, is, is the traditional fairy lore. And fairies had consistent features in, the, in a broad sense wherever they were experienced. And they were experienced all over the world, which is a mystery in itself. But each fairy culture was suited to its human neighborhood. So even though the kinds of behaviors and personalities and then just general phenomenology of fairies was the same worldwide, in every area where they were experienced, in every little culture and subculture, the fairies in some ways reflected their human neighborhood. And that didn't make their experiences, the experiences of encountering them any less frightening or mysterious. But it did suggest that the, whatever was stimulating fairy encounters, it wasn't a real fairy race that coexisted with us, that, that, that existed apart from us, that the experiences were tied to the human expectation of them in some strange way. And something of that may be playing out with, uh, you know, UFO occupant reports. Well, it's, that it's a real phenomenon. It's a mysterious phenomenon. But we are involved in fashioning our experiences of it. Well, it's, it's interesting you should point it out because in one hand you're saying that there is no sort of, in your mind, the possibility of a collective sort of a collective unconscious that would be able to manufacture these types of commonalities. But... On the other hand, you're kind of saying that there is. So where do you draw the line between, between those two viewpoints? Uh, this is really, I think this is fascinating stuff. This is, this is to me, where the real uh, meat is on the bone in this subject. And I don't agree this is the meat and the bone. I think this is the shadow. This is not the, the meat and the bone. The meat and the bone is a, is a close encounter, the second kind, or the radar visual. That's the meat. This is well, the ghost. We're dealing well, okay, this is the shadow of the meat. <laughs> this is the burp after the meal. Uh, you, when I say meat of the bone, this is what really excites me about, about ufology. I am involved right now in a hard data monitoring project, seven cameras, monitoring one of the hottest spots in North America. I do realize that hard data 
gathering properly scientific uh, uh, protocols or, or really the way to go and uh, I think is the most important approach and I'm hoping to talk about that later but in terms of what intellectually really gets me fired up is this shadow realm this ancient aspect to this whole thing that, that we're, we've been talking about I completely concur with you that that is what I have focused on in, in uh, the last 15 years in which I will continue to be most interested in. Yes, it is fascinating. You know, like Phil and Brogno and, and, uh, and Ellen Guiley right now are writing a book on the gin, uh, the wonderful uh, uh, work that's been done by Phil uh, in this realm and, and, and yourself and others. Uh, Jacques Vallée, of course, in a more esoteric sort of way. This I, runs I'm not a whole- fan of Vallée, by the way. I want to make that clear. Well, and, I, okay, I I'll that. tell you what. Tell or John Keel, for that matter. <laughs> Oh, tell us why. I think that in the current issue of International UFO Reporter, I have an extended review of the new book, Wonders in the Sky, by Jacques Vallée and Chris Aubeck. And I encourage people to read that extended review. It's in the International UFO Reporter. is published by the Center for UFO Studies, which needs your support on whose board I serve. And I think that Vallée has made some legitimate points but he really has really, I think, abused the evidence and exaggerated the the argument. I just really have a problem. And, and also Valet's hostility to the extraterrestrial hypothesis is just simply unwarranted. And uh, what the prob- basic problem with, with approaches like Valet's or John Keel's for that matter is that it's, it's just totalistic. It's, it demands that one size fit all. Well, it seems to me that one thing that should be very clear about anomalies generally and the UFO phenomena specifically is that one size does not fit all. That there are things that going on under the rubric of anomalies or UFOs that are fundamentally unlike, and I mean epistemologically unrelated. And unless you can see that, you're just contributing noise to the argument. So then there is not just a UFO mystery there. Is a UFO mystery and a UFO mystery? You get my there point? is the event phenomenon and the experience phenomenon. And this plays out through a wide range of anomalies, not just UFOs. And even in, you can even bring it into things like ball lightning, which is a recognized natural phenomenon, but a rather mysterious and elusive one. And, and you see experience anomalies rolling out of the event phenomenon of ball lightning. And, uh, you know, you, you've just got to, to define stuff. You can't just say that, well, okay, there was the RV-47 case, which is perfect evidence of a, a complex, sophisticated, advanced technology that does not exist on Earth and that it is reasonable to infer as extraterrestrial in origin. And then grab the a Mothman sighting and say that Mothman sighting overrides hard evidence cases like RB-47 or the Trans and Provence landing trace case and things like this. I'll tell you what, we'll pursue that further detail in a moment. We have Jerry Clark. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack Attack of the Rockwell. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans the galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack Attack of the Rockoids is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack Attack of the Rockoids, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. Normal blood pressure, naturally. How would that make you feel? I'm Don from New Mexico. January of 2000, I had a heart attack. 
Then my real health began going downhill, and I had uh, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, poor vision, and I really wasn't sleeping well. I was a mess, pretty much. Don reports dramatic improvements with heart and body extract. I started taking uh, heart and body extract, and from within a few days, I started sleeping a lot better. My blood pressure uh, normalized, my blood sugar normalized, and uh, my sleep really did improve. Experience these benefits and more when your body gets what it needs with the assistance of heart and body extract. Order at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305. That's hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305. And folks, I did not expect this at all. By the 7th, 8th, and ninth day, I saw dramatic improvements from taking heart and body extract. Details at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 for heart and body extract. Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at crossbreedholsters.com. Don't forget, crossbreedholsters.com. If you're serious about playing college football, give yourself the competitive edge with the National Underclassmen Football Combine. The NUC is the longest-running underclassmen event and the most respected combine and football camp in the nation. Specifically designed to give athletes early recruiting exposure, there's no better time than now to compete in the National Underclassmen Football Combine. Call 888-NUC-MVP1 or go to nationalunderclassmen.com to find out more. The food storage industry leader has done it again. Introducing FDG Clubs and Survival Bucks from the Freeze Dry Guy. For over 39 years, the Freeze Dry Guy has served various government agencies and the private sector with the finest in storable foods and emergency rations. If you've wanted to build emergency food supplies but couldn't afford it, now you can. Go to freezedryguy.com, click on products, and look for the Freeze Dry Guy Clubs to pay as you go. Now you can build food storage without going into debt. Choose from a payment range of $95 to $450 per month. Our clubs work with everyone's budget. Plus, when you join Freeze Dry Guy Clubs, you'll get additional rewards. For example, this month, get 10% back in survival bucks on all purchases in the Freeze Dry Guy product line, plus free shipping within the lower 48 states on any order amount. Hurry, go to freezedryguy.com or call 866-404-3663. That's freezedryguy.com or call 866-404-3663. The Freeze Dry Guy, the best you can buy. On air, online, and on demand. We are the GCN Radio Network. This is Leslie Kane, and I'm with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, and you are listening to the Paracast. We're trying to look at the lines of demarcation between the various aspects of the UFO mystery, and I have a question that occurs to me, which we'll bring up in a moment. We have Jerry Clark, co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. So, okay, we have people crying for disclosure. Now, disclosure implies that we know most of the answer and the government will affirm that E.T. is here, but you're painting the picture of something so much more complicated that maybe we have to look for a whole other issue, and if the government has anything to disclose, would they be interested in all this other stuff? Well, I think that let's just assume for the sake of discussion here that that some element of the U.S. government is really interested in UFOs, really is working on it and trying to solve it, and maybe has solved some of it. I think that at some point, (laughs) somebody pointed out to them, look, you know, citing the Mothman are not the same thing is the hard evidence cases and um, that if we're going to learn anything, we're really going to have to focus on the hard evidence cases because all you're going to get, if you look at the Mothman signs, the men in black and the abductions and the other world journeys and all that, you're just going to get a bunch of strange, scary stories that, you know, the person who tells them seems perfectly sincere and sane, but it's not going to get you anywhere. These things just don't, they don't get anywhere. They, they, they have to be seen, the, the experience anomalies, as pure testimony, as pure experience and nothing else because they don't, they don't get you beyond that. You can't prove that fairies, for example, exist. You can deduce that even though they don't exist, they can be experienced in some mysterious fashion, which 
seems manifestly true, and even many folklorists who have studied the, these, this lore in the field acknowledge that, yes, these people seem completely sincere, say that they had this experience. But, you know, it's the difference between, uh, you know, accepting somebody's story but rejecting his explanation. Well, okay, so if Stanton Friedman is affirmed, and the government says, well, they're coming here from Zeta Reticuli, we don't know their purpose, they do not appear to present a threat to our planet, there you go, we would have maybe a solution there, but this experiential phenomena, that would be a totally different ball of wax, right? Right. Yeah, I, I think that if there are extraterrestrials visiting Earth, we'll, kn we'll know that, because that's conceivable. In fact, the argument of ET-oriented ufologists is pretty much indistinguishable from the argument and the reasoning of the of the SETI oriented astronomer. It's just that the SETI people don't want to deal with UFO reports so they make up reasons to ignore them. But basically the argument is the same is that we have reason to believe, in fact growing reason to believe there are all kinds of extrasolar planets, millions and millions and millions of them. And many of them harbor intelligent civilizations. And if the galaxy if life is that ubiquitous and the galaxy is that densely populated it's not at all surprising that we're going to find evidence of their existence. And probably some of them are going to have come over here in the vehicles that their advanced technology made possible. Extraterrestrial visitation really shouldn't be a heresy. It may be happening or it may not be happening, but it's not a ridiculous or absurd idea. And some UFO reports indeed are susceptible most reasonably to that explanation. Um, it's the other stuff that really causes all the confusion, the discussion gets clogged up with all kinds of high strangest material, which is just simply unprovable. And so if you reject all the testimony as false or the product of delusion, all you've got left is making up phony explanations that don't explain. There has to be some third alternative that, yes, this is valid testimony, We, but it isn't what it sounds like. It is unexplainable, maybe inexplicable at this state of knowledge. And these are real experiences, but they don't tell us that that their mothmen exist in the ecosystem, or that there are fairies living in caves and on mountaintops. It just means that, in some way, we have experiences of extraordinary phenomena, but. They're unprovable. They're experienceable, but unprovable. You know, when you talk to someone like Stan Friedman again, who was on last week's episode of the Powercast, he'll say that some of these more mystical paranormal type events, this more experiential phenomena, that part of it is because what the UFOs do is so magical to us because they're so far in advance that they can create all this stuff. That this is still part of their reality. Yeah, I, th I've heard that argument before, which strikes me as really reductive. Now, you have to remember that you, the UFO phenomenon is a pretty recent arrival in a long, long historical tradition of extraordinary phenomena. The, the straight extraterrestrial hypothesis, which is what Stan Friedman advocates, and, and often eloquently, would be more persuasive if there were no other traditions of weird events and weird, excuse me, weird experiences in human history. But there's this enormous background noise of all kinds of just bizarre sights, experiences, phenomena. And to argue, as, as Stan does, it's really to argue, I think, from, well, to be maybe charitable here, not a great deal of knowledge of what this material consists of. There is no reason to believe that UFOs existed thousands of years ago and consistently covered themselves up by appearing in all kinds of other ways. What about visiting earthlings in biblical times? Some of those sound like UFO-related experiences. Like what? Well, Ezekiel's wheels. Oh, I don't think Ezekiel's will sound like they don't strike. They struck me as just kind of, you know, an experience anomaly. Some, you know, some visionary experiences. You really have to be determined to find evidence of extraterrestrials to unpack that into a UFO report. 
I think that the stuff in the Bible just sounds like, you know, a whole worldwide tradition of supernatural experiences. And we just take that at face value and that's it. It doesn't necessarily relate to what's going on now. So when did UFO arrival appear to have happened? Was it all after World War II or some of these older cases? Do they seem to have some kind of evidence for them? Certainly Charles Fort is an example of older cases. Well, that's a complicated question, but I'll try to go for the simple answer. That's what I'm here for. Uh, (laughs) Because it, it, it is very complicated. Okay, how do we know when UFOs showed up? Well, we go, we go into reports, contemporary reports, reports that were published at the time of their occurrence. And we look at what the people were describing. If you do that, you can go back two or three centuries with some confidence and find here and there reports that sound very much like modern UFO reports. I found a particularly striking one in an upstate New York newspaper from um, late uh, 1887 of what sounded very much like they like this. And this was published at the time. These are the reports that give you some confidence that there was a UFO phenomenon, as we understanding, understand it, occurring long ago, as in centuries ago, or several centuries ago anyway. The farther back you go, the less certain it gets. And you're dealing with a lot of what just sounds to be classic visionary or experience anomaly stuff. When you get into things like the 1897 airships, you're you're dealing with something that has been falsely absorbed into UFO history. The phantom airships had nothing to do with UFOs as we understand them. They were very strange, extremely weird, but they weren't UFOs as we understand UFOs. The modern UFO era, I really think, begins after I read Keith Chester's very good book on UFOs in World War II. It's called um, Strange Company. And Chester shows, I think, that the modern UFO era really began during, not after, World War II but that the world was so absorbed in fighting this horrendous conflict that people just weren't paying that kind of attention. I'll tell you, we have to pay attention to this, Jerry. Let's pay attention to the fact that we have Jerry Clark. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over five years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light System today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $209 and the Berkey guy will include three sport Berkey water bottles and ship everything to you free of charge. That's right, three sport Berkey water bottles and free shipping. An $87 value, yours free. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653. Or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. You know the Constitution like the back of your hand. 
You've read books, listened to podcasts, attended lectures, surfed websites, and watched videos. You've made liberty your life's goal, but something seems to be missing. Stickers from LibertyStickers.com. Exercise your freedom of speech with the world's most dangerous bumper stickers. That's LibertyStickers.com. But wait, there's more. You can buy Liberty Stickers wholesale. Get them for 99 cents each when you put 100 or more in your shopping cart in any combination. Sell them or give them away. They're great for gun shows, flea markets, fairs, outreach, and more. Earn extra money, promote freedom, and spread the word. Need custom stickers, labels, or decals for your organization or business? Liberty Stickers makes them. Go to LibertyStickers.com to order or call 877-873-9626. LibertyStickers.com, the world's most dangerous stickers. Extend your life with Extend When I had a heart attack at 42, I was not sure what the future held. But a year later, the doctors could find nothing wrong with me and took me off all my medication. What did I do? I took a herbal mixture of garlic, cayenne, and a few other herbs mixed in liquid form. I now call this Extendovite. I would have never believed that a few simple herbs could actually change my life like they did. Now it's your turn to see what the powers of garlic and cayenne can do for you. For only $69.95 plus shipping and handling for a two-month supply of either capsules or liquid, you too can begin on your path to better health. For more information, call 1-877-928-8822. That's 1-877-928-8822. Or visit our website at heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extend America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. You've entered another dimension. You've entered the Paracast. We continue with Jerome Clark, UFO historian. We're talking about UFOs, the history of UFOs, separating UFOs from other paranormal phenomena. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. So let's look at some of the events that are attached to UFOs and see what you think about them. Was there a crash at Roswell? Did our government recover evidence of this crash UFO? Well, I'm probably one of the handful of agnostics on that subject. Well, you know, there are a lot of those, more than you think. Oh, good. There should be, because it seems to me that's about all you can do with that, is say that Hmm. Yeah, this this is interesting, and and this is false, demonstrably false. And the the problem that I have with with the Roswell story, and I and I have a lot of respect for the investigators who put a lot of time in on this. You know, the Kevin Randalls, and Don Schmitz, Tom Carey, Stan Friedman, people like that. I mean, I really admire their work, and I think they've shown that there is a real historical mystery here. The problem is that. The Roswell incident, as ordinarily thought of, uh, th- that is uh, wreckage and bodies, is not part of history. You could hide the event itself. You could put the bodies in the wreckage in storage and put a lot of guards around them and threaten people who you know, were there and wanted to talk about it. You, yes, that could happen. But you couldn't hide it from history, that this would be uh, something in history that would leave a big mark that you could hide the story about the crash and the bodies, but you couldn't hide what followed from that. For example, extraordinary uh, technological advancement, changes in uh, national defense policy, and so on. There's no evidence of that. That that every attempt to to attach something of technological or political or international or defense significance to the crash of a UFO and bodies it can't be demonstrated. Yeah, but there's also the other question is, if we had this evidence of greatly advanced technology, we wouldn't know what to do with it. Take your iPhone and go back to 1945 and have them figure it out. Well, there's some merit to that argument, but I don't think that really is, is, is a sufficient rebuttal to it because something would have been learned. And also, it would have, even if you put 
technological advancement aside, there is no evidence in anything that happened in international relations, in politics and defense policy that indicates that the U.S. government was aware suddenly that the Earth was being visited by extraterrestrials of uncertain motive and uncertain capacity. That would have all kinds of national defense implications, which could not be hidden. So those things and, couldn't be hidden even if the original case could be. So right. what were these people remembering 20, 30 years later, or were their memories just so influenced by ongoing events and popular culture that they added more into the story than maybe was present originally? I don't know, and none of us knows. And some of this testimony is indeed impressive and, and intriguing. There's no question about that. It's just that Roswell, like so much of the, what we deal with in anomalistics, really exists in, in testimony, but nowhere else. You really have, you have this really interesting testimony from, you know, some of these people seem completely sincere and plausible, and, uh, and their testimony is hard to explain. But that's all it is. It's about as extraordinary a claim as you could possibly make uh, tied to virtually nothing but anecdotal testimony. And so logic demands that you say, well, Whatever happened, it wasn't what it was talked, about, what it was claimed to be by these people. But you don't know that, and so pretty soon, it's just a big muddle. And so when people ask me what I think about Roswell, I answer them as honestly as I can by saying, it's a historical mystery. And leave it at that. And of course, then maybe Colonel Corso didn't go around feeding night goggles and printed circuit inventions to <laughs> private industry. No, I don't think so. So what was his thing there? Do you think it was just the old guy trying to make some money for his family before he went on to the next life? I, I can't read his mind, and I'm not going to speculate. All I can tell you is that I remember talking with John Alexander, who knew Corso well and didn't believe the story, but thought that Corso acted like a guy who was completely sincere. And uh, I think that you know there are people walking around the world who sincerely believe things that, that didn't happen. In, in their own lives. So I don't know. All I really care to know is that his story is just simply not true and not poss not capable of belief. And I think that it's really kind of a sideshow to the basic Roswell controversy, which I think, as I say, remains you know puzzling, but it's just hard to come to any conclusion from it. What about these people who say, okay, we want the government, this repeats what Kehoe was asking in the 50s, we want disclosure. We want the government to tell us what it knows. They must know something. Oh, I think that's probably a pretty futile gesture. You know, it's, 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 it's based on a lot of presumptions about what the government knows, what, you know, that I'm not willing to make myself. And also, I think that the, the disclosure movement is really you know, uncomfortably reminiscent in some ways of the, of the contact e movement in the 1950s, you know, based on the premise that there are you know, benevolent space beings here and and the evil government is trying to, you know, stop them. And it, it's just, to me, is kind of irrational, it's, you know. So we're not going to be seeing you speaking at the X conference anytime soon. I don't imagine, no. And they won't be asking you. But the other question, of course, being, do you think it's possible if E.T. is here that any earthly government has had any contact with them at all? Well, you know, rumors like that, in, in, I write. I actually write about them in my encyclopedia, and as a folklore, the stories were circulating as early as probably 1948. That um, Harry Truman had met the aliens in Alaska, and uh, they had discussed them. This is before, them. ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Palin lived in Alaska. <laughs> and um, so this is, you know, this is a body of folklore that's been around for a long time, and uh, I don't. I've never seen you know, any evidence for it. I wouldn't say that it's a priori impossible because I don't know, but I could say that, that no persuasive evidence has ever emerged that anything like that has happened. So Eisenhower didn't go and meet the aliens at uh, yeah, That was another at, one Edwards. from 1954. That was yeah. a famous one. Yep. But the, there's so, a whole bunch of them that went over the years that there was one from Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico in 1964 that had UFOs landing and 
and the landing being filmed and the aliens coming out and being met by officers and Holloman. And, yeah, I mean, these stories have always been around. But you don't take any of them seriously. So does that mean that the government is just either uninterested because there's no overt threat or they have simply not had any of this alleged communication? It just stays out there one step away, one step beyond. I think that probably what the U.S. government is doing, as we discussed earlier, is probably has some little agency that on some level is monitoring, you know, puzzling UFO sightings. And then meeting periodically say, well, you know, we've got this information and, and there was that case and, and trying to make sense of it. That's probably about as close as they get to <laughs> to the actual UFO intelligences. What about the possibility of man-made uh, technologies uh, being trotted out and and people, you know, misidentifying them as something as, as something alien or, or something off planet? Uh, do you think uh, we have the technological capabilities now to uh, possibly put anti-grav uh, technology operational or well I don't know about anti-gravity technology but I do believe that as a, our aviation technology is ever more sophisticated and amazing uh, yeah I think that you really do now have probably secret aircraft that are mistaken for UFOs and I think that that's unlike what it was the, the very first UFO theory in the summer of 1947, when the modern UFO age began, was that these were secret military experiments. Well, of course, we've known for a long time that they weren't, but now there, I think there is some credibility to that as an explanation for some reports. Yeah. Yeah, if I'd seen a stealth fighter back in, let's say, 78, 79 fly over, I would have probably reported it as a UFO. And it's no doubt that's a strange looking thing. Sure. Absolutely. Well, we, we have some questions from. Uh, some of our Paracast Forum members. And-, and I'll tell you what, we're going to bring them up in the next hour of the Paracast. A reminder here, you can reach us. You can write to us, news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. Or go to forum.paracast.com. That's forum.paracast.com, where you can sign up, become a member of our forums, give yourself a username, get involved. And then you have the opportunity, like, some of our members are already taking advantage of, and that is to ask, leave questions for our guests, and we try to ask many of them. Jerry Clark is our guest. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit, then carting to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Final hour. It's taken much less than two hours, but the final hour of the Paracast with UFO historian Jerome Clark. We have our co-host Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. And now it's time to open up the questions from our members of the Paracast forums, Chris. Well, one one that, that uh, it, I think we've already kind of covered it, but uh, it's an interesting uh, <laughs> languaging uh, in the question, and I'll just read it verbatim. What about going toward Richard Shaver by way of Ray Palmer, keeping underground with Mac Tones and John Keel with ultra and crypto terrestrials, and jumping back to the top of the world with these Google photos Mr. O'Brien just post, posted here at Antarctica, um, from Antarctica, tie that with the other mysterious caves and Cremo's forbidden archaeology, and you'll soon need a second episode with Mr. Clark. 
just to bring you up to speed on the photographs that he's referring to, I was made aware of these very intriguing uh, photographs of uh, quite large, uh, seemingly unusual looking cave entrances down in Antarctica. There's two of them, one on either side of a ridge line. They're about 60 meters high and uh, probably twice that in width. Uh, basically, I think where our questioner is going with this, though, is w what is your idea of crypto-terrestrials, for instance, as uh, Mac Tone's, uh dubbed them, or John Keel's idea of the ultra-terrestrial, some sort of species of, of possibly quasi-humans that have been here for thousands of years that are hidden out of sight, possibly underground, sub-oceanic. Uh, do you have any sense that, the, that there could be something to, to this line of thinking? Well... Cryptoterrestrials and ultraterrestrials are not the same thing at all. The ultraterrestrials are Keel's name for demonic entities. Keel is essentially a demonologist, and that was his name for demons, which he thought were behind UFOs and a whole range of weird phenomena. Cryptoterrestrials were are an idea that there's there's a kind of goes back to lost continent lore, which I actually discuss in my new book, which is titled Hidden Realms. It's an old idea, it's just a new name for it, that there was a secret race that lived on the earth and somehow escaped documentation or observation or the massive evidence of an advanced technology which would have had to leave. Now, I don't, I don't believe it. It's, it's true, but I do think that it is the latest manifestation of a whole lot of kind of you know, lost civilization lore. And so there's not an, a, a hidden sun inside the planet, there's not holes at the poles. Or a that race sort of living thing. inside the middle of the earth or anything like that. <laughs> right. But, but, you know, these are longstanding kind of, you know, modern mythologies that are interesting for the, in themselves. You know, so it's a good intellectual exercise to come up with ways to uh, try to discount all that. It's I mean, not, my, it's my, not that my, difficult. My most recent book is, is on that subject. So anyone who wants to know my thoughts can look up the book on Amazon or go in their local bookstore or whatever. And, you know, I'll tell you what, like, ladies and gentlemen, we also put a link to the book on the com. So if you click on that link and buy a copy, which of course enriches Jerry Clark and we want him to be very rich and famous, it also enriches us by a few cents. <laughs> okay, here's another one for you. What are your thoughts on the binary code from one of the witnesses from the Bentwaters case, uh, which is currently starting to make some waves out there in the field? You know, I don't really uh, know enough about to have an opinion. I, it's one thing that you learn if you live long enough is not to shoot your mouth off when you don't know what you're talking about. So I just, I'm afraid I'll have to pass on that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I constantly uh, uh, find myself with a taste of my shoe in my mouth uh, sometimes. So I, I should take your advice a little bit more on that. Yeah. Okay. Here, here's a good one. This, this one we have not been asked. I think uh, none of our guests actually have been asked this, but but what are your thoughts on the current crop of ufologists that are coming up? Um, actually, I'm rather encouraged. I um, if you expand that to you to a Fordians or anomalous, I think there's some very sharp young guys coming up who really I really like, like uh, uh, Teo Paymans from uh, Holland is to me just like. He's going to be one of the one of the great anomalous of the next generation. Chris Aubeck. Um, there are a bunch of them. But Chris Aubeck is an English guy who's lived in Madrid for many years. He's about he co-authored Valet's most recent book. He did the research for the book into um, you know ancient anomalies from 1879 back to you know into well into the BCE era and. Um, yeah, there are some very sharp, smart young guys coming up, and um, I don't know. I, I feel really good about that. I didn't a few years ago, but as I've encountered some of these young guys who are intellectually very sharp and really working hard to expand the database and and analyze it intelligently, uh, yeah, I feel fairly good about the future. Well, one of the things that I've noticed, Jerry, is that uh, your average age at a, at a UFO convention now is up around 70. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, and those are the youngers. And those the are the younger ones. They're, uh, they, they, they can actually get up and in, in around without a walker. Um, but how do we, as, as the older uh, generation, and, and I count myself among uh, you guys, even though I'm only just, you know, I'm 50-ish, I'm um, how do You're we just a baby, that's all. I'm just a baby in this field, yeah. <laughs> but uh, 
what are the best ways do you, you think to in, instill some excitement, instill some uh, wonder and awe in the younger generation to get them to be less jaded and cynical about the subject and, and accept the pop cultural versions that are being force fed you know them and, and get them to actually become more involved in nuts and bolts uh, UFO research what do you have any suggestions uh, on how we can do that? Besides writing well, books and trying to inspire people that way, is there any other way that we can get people more involved uh, from the younger generation? Well, I think that that my answer is a broad one, but I'm quite serious about it, and that is that if young people continue to read books and continue to be intellectually curious, as as our generation was, or at least some of us in that generation were, and um, they'll get to us. You know, um, if, you know, books still influence people, particularly young, impressionable minds. And um, you know, reading a single book can be a life-changing experience, as it was for me, and, and it may have been for you guys. Yeah, it was you, for me. Yeah, you read Rupelt or Fort or somebody like that, or Jacques Vallée or Alan Hynek, and you think, you know, this is really interesting. And... Um, I think that's you know I, I you know I think that the the model when when Gene and I were young as I mentioned earlier in this discussion there were all these teenage UFO groups they don't exist and nobody even is, remembers that they exist except those of us who were there or David Halperin will talk about in his new novel which comes out next month and you know so the model changes I think like the model of the organizations like the Mutual UFO Network or MUFON or even KUFOS, which is a different kind of organization from MUFON, but still in the old model of the UFO organization, that probably is disappearing. The Internet is taking over a lot of things, and the discussion will continue on the Internet, but the but, but print, old-fashioned print books will still come out, and people who want to read them will read them. And, and of course, will, if they want to read them on their iPads or in their Amazon Kindle, they'll read them, but it's still the book, and it's still the same basic content. I'm betraying my age. I just love the old-fashioned book. In fact, three of them arrived in my mail today. I just love the physical feel of a book. My The big love affair of my life, aside from you know my wife and my children and so on, and my friends, has been books. I love books. I love the feel of books. And it was books that got me here. And it will be books or their equivalent to get young people to where we are or their equivalent of where we are. As someone who covers personal technology, I kind of think that maybe one way this will be dealt with is where they will add an odor that emanates from your ebook reader. <laughs> so your Kindle, your iPad, or your Samsung Galaxy tab will present the odor of paper and print. I love that idea. Isn't <laughs> That's that a great cool? idea. I just invented this thing. If anyone wants to take advantage of this, you know, I have very liberal terms. I will give you my concept. You develop the smell of vision. I tried smell of vision, it never worked. Oh, yeah, John heavens. Waters, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Scratch and sniff. We're not gonna sniff now. They still do that, by the way, in the women's magazines for perfumes and stuff. We have Jerome Clark, UFO historian. The co host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Hi, this is Tamar from Namecheap. We're a domain name and web hosting company, and we really care about our customers. With domain name purchases, Namecheap offers free SSL and free WhoisGuard for a year to protect your identity from spammers. Most importantly, we care about you. If you'd like to learn more, please visit us at radio.namecheap.com, radio.namecheap.com for web hosting and domain name specials. You can also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash Namecheap or become a fan of ours on Facebook at facebook.com slash Namecheap. See you online. For 58 years, fate has provided true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate brings you the latest in all aspects of the paranormal, like angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, and much, much more. To receive your complimentary fate magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. 
Again, the Congressional Budget Office sounds the alarm, this time warns of Greek-style U.S. debt crises. You heard me right. The GAO is drawing a parallel between the U.S. economy, its debt, and the current Greek economic meltdown. With the debt-to-GDP chart climbing into unfamiliar territory, the growing budget deficit will rise to unsupportable levels. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. The Federal Debt and Risk of Financial Crises document the CBO has published is a must-read for every American, covering the risk of continued deficit spending coupled with an aging population and the rising interest rates spell economic disaster. It's imperative that you get a copy of this document and study it for yourself. Call me today at 800-686-2237, and I'll send you a free copy. Again, call 800-686-2237 and ask for your copy of the CBO document. Once again, you need to read this government report. Call 800-686-2237. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over five years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light System today complete with with two black Berkey elements for only $209, and the Berkey guy will include three sport Berkey water bottles and ship everything to you free of charge. That's right, three sport Berkey water bottles and free shipping. An $87 value, yours free. Call the Berkey guy at 1 886 3653. That's 1 886 3653. Or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. I'm concerned about food for my family in the event of an emergency, and I know you are too. Are you ready? Don't wait for an emergency to happen. Put a plan together now with quality dehydrated food from Ready Reserve Foods. For nearly 40 years, Ready Reserve Foods has been in continuous operation canning the finest in dehydrated foods. Other companies just broker canned foods. Ready Reserve is the manufacturer, controlling quality from start to finish with double enameled cans and nitrogen packing for maximum shelf life. Ready Reserve offers a balanced selection of fruits, vegetables, dairy products, proteins, and grains. Choose from a variety of pre-selected units or order by individual can to customize your own plan. When you purchase from Ready Reserve Foods, you are buying factory direct at wholesale prices. Call today for a free catalog, 1-800-453-2202 or visit readyreservefoods.com. Call 1-800-453-2202. Ready Reserve Foods, factory direct, wholesale pricing. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com Get in on all the action at forum.theparacast.com Jerome Clark is our guest. He's a UFO historian of long standing. He's been there forever since they wrote the very first song. No, he's written songs but not about UFOs, right? That's correct, yeah. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberger in the Paracast. Chris, any more questions from the Peanut Gallery? Well, unfortunately, we, we only had the uh, the question thread up. Uh, we started it yesterday, so no, we don't. I'm sure if it had been up another couple of days, there'd be about 10 or 12 of them on there. But uh, And now he has it. more because he's going to have to come back to the PowerCast Absolutely. and answer all the questions raised by what he says. And let's look at also one of the suggestions that Leslie Kane makes in her UFO book, and that is that there be some kind of, I guess, government, quasi-government organization that is formed to investigate UFOs. What do we do to get science to get involved in this, not just a few scientists, but enough people to really try to figure out what's going on? Well, something transparent and public, I think, is is kind of the the caveat on that. I'll drink to that. My experience is that if you write a book or an article or a review that is intellectually sound, at least it doesn't sound crazy, that it respects reason and evidence, and it's written logically and coherently, that people who 
respond to that, many of them scientists or other academics, you'll get a favorable response. Over over uh, my career, I have had all kinds of dealings with academics and scientists and so on, most of whom are not known in the as active participants in the controversy, but do have a you know a private curiosity. And they will read reasonable literature that does not insult their intelligence, that does not address crazy ideas or anything like that. I sort of remember one time, many years ago, this must have been in the early 1980s, I went to see Roy Mackle at the University of Chicago. And Mackle, to those who don't know him, is uh, probably the most important cryptozoologist with an academic affiliation of his time. And he was a co-founder of the sadly now go gone International Society of Cryptozoology. But Roy was a fascinating guy with wide ranging interests in about three brains. He was, well, he's still alive. I haven't heard from him in a while, but he's a very, very smart guy and very nice guy too, a lot of fun to be around. And anyway, I was visiting him at his office and Roy had written a book or two, a couple of books on cryptozoology. And um, he, he was looking at his mail when I was there, and he opened up this airmail letter from France. And it was from a fellow scientist. And the scientist said something like, oh, I wish I could do what you do. I, I really admire your work. It sounds fascinating. I'm intrigued by, by these reports of these strange animals that you've investigated and so on. And this guy had, had spent his entire career as a biologist dealing with some arcane issue involving flatworms. And to him, Roy Mackle was the ideal of the adventurous scientist investigating interesting questions, opening up new avenues of knowledge. And there are a lot of scientists out there who really envy those who dare go forth and wish they could do it, but don't because they know it would endanger their careers and their jobs and open them up to, you know, attack and ridicule. And, um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of scientists out there who are privately curious. And one day, because you can't put aside reality or truth forever, one day a future generation of scientists will take up the UFO phenomenon. It's inevitable. It won't be in our lifetimes. It won't be in the lifetimes of most living scientists, but it'll happen. It'll. I suspect it'll happen sometime in the middle to the later 21st century, but well, it'll happen. Of course, the other True. question being, Jerry, that if E.T. is here, wouldn't E.T. at one point decide, yes, we need to land now and make our presence known if they haven't done so already? That could always happen. <laughs> we Just don't know. try it on the White House lawn. They got guys with stingers on the roof. I think that this, what we, we, I am making the presumption that what we have seen in the last 60 years will go on and it will be up to us to do something about it, or at least our descendants. Right. How do you do anything about it? That's the other question. Right. I mean, do you well, try you do, to communicate with them? Do you try to communicate no, with them? You do, you do science. That's, yeah. I believe that if science had been done to UFOs over the last 60 years, we'd probably know what at least the core UFO phenomenon is. I think that, that all that's really probably lacking is the will to do science, to do the funding, to have the laboratories and the personnel and the expertise available. I think the core UFO phenomenon is not inherently inexplicable. I believe that it's eminently solvable, but it's complicated, and it, because it's complicated, it's going to be expensive. But there is this barrier of rejection and ridicule that has stopped science in its tracks. Brad Sparks estimates that in the entire history of the UFO controversy, a total of six months of actual science has been done. Yeah, that's, that's scary. Of course, we, we don't know to what extent uh, the government has been conducting uh, scientific work on the, uh, on the inside uh, out of the public eye. Well, science is consistent conducted secretly is useless. I mean, it, it, it doesn't get us anywhere. And in its purpose has to be extremely limited or provincial. I mean, science right. it has to be an open enterprise. One would hope. <laughs> now, of course, the other question here, and we'll maybe pursue this in this segment and a little bit more, 
The one question very briefly mentioned, but now maybe it's time to explore it further. UFO abductions, is that really E.T.? Are these people imagining this? Is the government doing some kind of deceptive work causing these things to happen? <laughs> My None labs. <laughs> None of the above. I, I think the, the abduction phenomenon is an experience anomaly. And uh, that it's, you know, only superficially related to the the UFO phenomenon of the CE2. That this is a continuation of abductions into supernatural realms, you know, fairyland or heaven or hell or wherever. Incubi and succubi. Yeah, that, that, yes, that come out of a long, long human tradition of other world journeys. I think that, that abductions, you know, they're unquestionably a genuine anomaly. I mean, they're not purely imaginary. They're very puzzling, and we don't have an explanation for them. But they don't seem to be events. They're vivid, frightening experiences, but they're not events. They're taking place in that kind of liminal zone between, you know, the indiv individual awareness and the cultural imagination. So, therefore, if E.T. lands tomorrow whatever they look like, and we somehow communicate with them and we say, why are you abducting our population? You feel they'll say, we're not doing that. That has nothing to do with us. It's entirely possible. You know, it's possible. It's possible to tell you that we have Jerome Clark, and he's joining us on the Paracast. We're happy to have him for the whole show, not as a eulogy for someone long past. He's author of a number of books, including the Encyclopedia of UFOs and Hidden Realms, Lost Civilizations, and Beings from Other Worlds, his most recent book. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in The Paracast. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the Earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net that's mr ufo at webtv.net find out what they don't want you to know there are many types of storable foods but how about a superfood that contains every nutrient that the human body needs for survival 50 percent protein 300 milligrams of potassium per ounce, and calcium and magnesium for your heart and bones, with many more nutrients found in this incredible food source that the government does not want you to have. This product is available in powder, seeds, and oil, and is shipped free to your door in the U.S. This product is illegal to grow in the U.S., but is legal to import. Don't waste time thinking about storing food. Plan ahead and prepare for yourself and your family now, and be in control of your destiny. You can save and invest your money, but in the end, food will be your greatest asset. Remember what the Word of God says in Ezekiel 719. Call 908-691-2608 and see what the powder, seeds, and oil can do for you. Remember, food will be your greatest asset. Call 908-691-2608. This product does not contain THC. Call 908-691-2608 today. You know the Constitution like the back of your hand. You've read books. Listen to podcasts, attended lectures, surfed websites, and watched videos. You've made liberty your life's goal, but something seems to be missing. Stickers from LibertyStickers.com. Exercise your freedom of speech with the world's most dangerous bumper stickers. That's LibertyStickers.com. But wait. 
There's more. You can buy Liberty Snickers wholesale. Get them for 99 cents each when you put 100 or more in your shopping cart in any combination. Sell them or give them away. They're great for gun shows, flea markets, fairs, outreach, and more. Earn extra money, promote freedom, and spread the word. Need custom stickers, labels, or decals for your organization or business? Liberty Stickers makes them. Go to libertystickers.com to order or call 877-873-9626. Libertystickers.com, the world's most dangerous stickers. Hello, at ofthefield.com, we strive to empower you with wild food preparedness. We get lots of amazing positive feedback, most of which we feature on ofthefield.com. Here's a small sample of all that people like you have to say about the wild food experience. It's inspiring for many who are affected by the recent downturn of the economy. I already knew a bit about foraging and edibles, but you take it to a whole new level. A thousand thanks to you for all that great knowledge. It was empowering. When I was in the Navy, I went through a couple of quick land survival classes. Thank you for being an inspiration and for all the work that you do. I really appreciate the depth and detail of the information. Thank you so much. Much love and respect to you from all of us here in the boonies thanks again knowledge is power and that power brings peace folks thanks for letting us help you get back to basics read all of the testimonials at of you can order online for you and your loved ones or call 1-888-51-EAT-FREE to share in the secret the gcn radio network providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio g c n Great Talk Radio starts here. Hi, this is Clifford Cliff, the International Director for the Mutual UFO Network. You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We continue with Jerome Clark, UFO historian. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. And, okay, so, therefore, we shouldn't be worrying so much about all the arguments is, or maybe we should worry about using hypnotic regression to recall supposed lost memories, whether it has anything to do with UFOs or is something else entirely. Is that something that is something that could be used in research? Well, Eddie Buller did a study back in the 1980s, which has been widely overlooked, but he mentions it in his new book, The Myth and Mystery of UFOs, which just came out a couple of months ago. But hypnotic aggression, of course, obviously that can be abused, but that doesn't seem to be what's generating UFO abduction reports. Eddie had the, the brilliant idea to compare abduction narratives that were recalled under hypnosis versus those that were recalled consciously, and he found out that there's no significant difference. And he also um, addressed another question I sometimes hear from skeptics of abduction phenomena who claim that, well, the, uh, the hypnotist is feeding the uh, people leading questions so that they get, that's why these stories sound so much alike, because the hypnotist comes with expectations and draws those same expectations out of the hypnotized person's account. Well, it turns out that it doesn't really even matter who the hypnotist is. Stories still end up pretty much the same. All that this tells us is that there is an abduction experience that exists outside hypnosis, and that hypnosis is probably just incidental. It's just a way of drawing it out, but that it's already there. But it doesn't mean that it involves the interaction with extraterrestrials. They're just like all experience anomalies. Abduction stories are interestingly consistent, and there are some inconsistencies also, but but they're just hard to explain. They're hard to explain as extraterrestrial phenomena, or they're hard to explain as as you know purely imaginary phenomena. They exist somewhere in that, in, as I say, in that kind of threshold liminal zone of of experience anomalies. All kinds of other high strangeness phenomena, which have no UFO connection whatsoever. So we're not dealing with uh, ET gathering genetic material to hybridize a dying race and the types of scenarios that have, you know, kind of been formulated over the years based on on these testimonies. No, I, I you know, I think you're referring to Dave Jacobs's theories, and uh, Dave is a very good friend for whom I have great affection. But I, I don't agree that these are happening on an event level, and I don't believe that an alien invasion is imminent. <laughs> this, well, that's good news. <laughs> no, Dave does. If you've read his books, he does. Yeah, believe. oh, yeah. 
that an alien invasion is imminent. And I, I don't. I don't just. I just don't find that. I find that his material is very interesting, sometimes disturbing, but not, you know, compellingly evidence of real events. Now, what about events like the Men in Black? Is that something that relates to the realm of unusual personal experience? Or are private people, the government, all of the above involved? Well, it's, 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 <laughs> I guess I would say all of the above, or, or at least some of the above. Um, I think that the core men in black phenomenon is, as any number of commentators on men in black stories have remarked, and qu quite correctly, the original man in black was the devil. And the man in black exists, I mean, you can hear references to the the man in black in old, you know, balloon songs. I mean, this, this is an image been around for a long time. Also Johnny Cash. Yeah, although Johnny Cash imagined the the man in black as as a as a virtuous figure, that virtuous storyteller who told us yeah. about life, and its trials and tribulations and joys. But in, for example, in the folklore of the African American South, reflecting a worldwide tradition, but you hear this, for example, in like Robert Johnson's famous song, Crossroads Blues, where you meet the devil who is a man in black at a crossroads at midnight and that you get magical powers from him, but of course at a great price. And I think that somehow this idea of the man in black, which first shows up in a UFO-like contest context in about 1905 in Wales, and um, you get this kind of image that gets transplanted in experience anomaly. And they're always showing up in some kind of menacing context, possessing secret knowledge, which you can get, but only at great price and peril. And I think that's where the, the men in black comes from. There's also, they also figure hoaxes, just plain old fashioned hoaxes, also help perpetrate this lore like the man in black in the Maury Island hoax of 1947, which is the first great UFO hoax. You get them and you know whatever Gray Parker did with Al Bender's experience in 1953, and you know it's just it's just a lore that has, and then you probably actually have people who the FBI called on for one reason or another, or somebody from a you know a, a military intelligence agency where he wears civilian clothing. I'm sure part of those some of those things have happened, and they've contributed to the lore. But no, I don't think the men, in the short, I don't think men in black are really central to the UFO question. It's what about just, the government getting involved in spreading disinformation? Is there such a thing? Do they care? I think that it's entirely possible. For example, in the 1980s, where you get a lot of this, these crazy stories circulating about government in contact with aliens or crash saucers, and you get people in uniform telling these stories. And you wonder if there wasn't some kind of you know, low-level psi war experiment going on. I don't think that this is anything hashed at a very high level, but it could have come out of, you know, low-level elements of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Yeah, I think about, that's entirely possible. Like a ring yeah, like kind the of Benowitz thing, yeah. Yeah. case. Yeah, you might, you might see it in things like that, yeah. Would you, you see know. it also in the MJ-12 documents? Possibly. Um Possibly. Um, you you would find it in something like that, but on the other hand, it may just be some idiot, you know, preying on gullible ufologists. I don't know. I mean, I, I have no doubt that the MJ-12 documents are bogus, and that's really the extent that I care about them. Where they come from is just detail. It's something I'd like to know, but it's not an important issue. Does that kind of denigrate the credibility of a person like Stanton Friedman who adopts the MJ-12 documents and Roswell as things that we should be concerned about? Um, I think he's chewing on that one, Gene. It's a chewable question. I understand that. Now, I just, I'll just say that I don't agree with Stan's emphasis on these things. Okay. I'll let it go at that. That's fair enough. We understand we all have levels of things that we accept and don't accept. Now, any popular sightings that we're aware of that ended up being hoaxes, even though maybe initially they were thought to be something that was genuine? Well, you know, sometimes hoaxes come to light. I remember, you know, the famous story from 1897 about the 
aliens who took the calf out of the pasture at uh, Leroy, Kansas. And um, that story seemed credible. It was widely published in the UFO literature in the 1960s. But miraculously, I found a, a woman who's, um, who had a relative, I think, I can't remember if it was her aunt or her grandmother off the top of my head, who had been there the day the hoaxer walked into the house and told his wife about the story he and his pals in town had cooked up. So, you know, I mean, there, obviously there are hoaxes out there, and uh, every once in a great while a story that had seemed credible turns out to be a hoax. But, it, you know, the Air Force, even the Air Force acknowledged long ago that hoaxes weren't really a big part of UFO reporting. But you always have to be, you know, on the lookout for one because you never know. We didn't have, of course, lots of people like Ray Barker and Jim Mosley running around with their Lost Creek UFO and models of flying saucers and strings and stuff like that. Well, I think that actually the, there, there are much better hoaxes than those. We know that. That was a rather transparent one. We, <laughs> with <yeah>. Photoshop. <laughs> Nowadays, like, yes. I'll tell you, we'll get into more of that in a moment. We have Jerry Clark. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in. The Paracast. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. This special announcement is brought to you by Renaissance Charge. Have you ever wondered if you could make your car run on 100% electric power for free? It is now possible. How about a simple device that is both a super efficient motor and a free energy generator at the same time? What if this could also be used to restore useless batteries and save you lots of money? Because our customers ask for it, we have organized a Renaissance Charge Conference Workshop on July 29th to July 31st at the beautiful Coeur d'Alene Resort in Idaho. Not only will you see these fascinating energizers, but you will be able to build some alongside genius inventor John Bedini. Participate in this truly historic event featuring our cutting-edge alternative energy, Tesla technology. Register early for the best seats and advanced workshop by visiting rcharge.com. That's r-charge.com for details. Or call 208-772-4514. That's 208-772-4514. Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at CrossbreedHolsters.com. Don't forget, CrossbreedHolsters.com. If you're serious about playing college football, give yourself the competitive edge with the National Underclassmen Football Combine. The NUC is the longest-running underclassmen event and the most respected combine and football camp in the nation, specifically designed to give athletes early recruiting exposure. There's no better time than now to compete in the National Underclassmen Football Combine. Call 888-NUC-MVP1 or go to nationalunderclassmen.com to find out more. Did you know that you can be tracked and traced when you're online? With identity theft and cybercrimes on the rise, your passwords, your identity, and even your physical location can be revealed to complete strangers. Would you like to surf the Internet anonymously and not have to worry about these threats? Well, now you can by visiting PatriotInternet.com. For about $2 per month, PatriotInternet.com will conceal your IP address and your physical location, allowing you to browse the web, send emails, and instant message anonymously. PatriotInternet.com will bypass 
filters, block sites, and keyword blocking. You can also bypass logging by your router and your ISP. With PatriotInternet.com, there is no software to install and uses 128-bit encryption for your protection. When using wireless hotspots, PatriotInternet.com shields your information from identity thieves and is compatible with Windows, Mac, and Linux. Protect your identity and your freedom with anonymous Internet access from PatriotInternet.com. Visit PatriotInternet.com today. On air, online, and on demand, we are the GCN Radio Network. You're in the Paracast. You never know what's going to happen next. Yes, neighbors, we do want to hear from you. If you have a question or a comment about the Paracast, send it on to us, news at theparacast.com. One more time, that's news at theparacast.com. We read every letter we get. We've come down to this one more segment with Jerome Clark, UFO historian. I'm Gene Steinberg. Chris O'Brien is the co-host during the Paracast. So we were looking, of course, about UFO hoaxes. Of course, then we have the Billy Meyer photos, which are pretty transparent, too, although a few people believe them. Well, there are some really sophisticated hoaxes, you know, hoaxes that people really spend a lot of time and thought on. And um, sometimes, you know, you come upon something and you can't prove it is a hoax, but your instinct tells you that it is, even if you can't prove it. And I find after, you know, years of experience with this that, you know, it doesn't hurt to listen to your instincts. You know, they're they're not coming out of nowhere. And um, so I think that, you know, I think one of the most successful hoaxes in UFO history is the MJ-12 papers. You know, they got a, they, you know, most people don't believe it anymore. But for a while, they did get a lot of, you know, people who are ordinarily sensible, including me, you know, going and puzzled and thinking, wow, what is this? And then as we came to know more about the background and the personalities involved and and also the utter the contradictions the inability to to force fit the claims of mj12 papers with anything that could be documented historically well then we came to understand that this was a hoax but as hoaxes go it's a pretty good one and any accounting of ufo hoaxes mj12 papers have to figure prominently and as you pointed out you know you still have at least one prominent ufologist, Dan Friedman, going around, you know, arguing vehemently and, and relentlessly for the authenticity of, of of these papers. So as a hoax, it was a successful one. Isn't it also difficult for somebody who maybe stakes a part of their reputation on something that turns out not to be true to backtrack to say, you know what, I was fooled by this, let's get on with our lives? I think some people do do indeed have a problem like that. I, I don't doubt that Stan is entirely sincere, but I've told him he, he was kind enough to send me his the two editions of his book on MJ-12. And when he sent them to me, I thought, I'm going to sit down and read these books as if I have had, had no opinion about this. I did everything possible to wipe the slate clean and read it with an open mind. And um, it still wasn't convincing to me. And I And in fact, I was puzzled why Stan thought this was convincing. That in, in history, which I'm greatly interested in, there are all kinds of questions about you know, contested documents. And uh, so I'm familiar with a lot of controversies about how questions concerning contested documents about historical events are settled. And the evidence that Stan was able to bring forth for the uh, MJ-12 papers struck me as something that a serious historian would have just dismissed out of hand. It wouldn't have even risen to the level of controversy. Ouch. But it's, you know, you know, it, it, uh, Sam has his views, and and uh, he's not going to change his mind. We it never even really talked about the rest of us say. We didn't even talk about the MJ-12 documents with Stan when he was on here last week. But uh, I guess we kind of will save that for uh, another show, Gene. Well, I think I touched on it in passing, but I felt, you know, if we're going to have that kind of discussion, we should have two people in the room virtually arguing for and against it. It could be a Jerry Clark. It could be a Kevin Randall, someone. It should arguing. be a Kevin Randall. Kevin is really immersed in that stuff. He knows far more than I do. Well, definitely then we'll consider that with Kevin Randall, someone who would argue 
on the side of it being a hoax, and then we see where the chips fall. I think well, they'd be I flying be around a little bit. Yeah, but but I think you know it would be interesting to listen to. But you know the fight has been fought in print, and um, those who followed the the dispute in print would pretty much know. You know, I you know they both have their distinctive rhetorical styles, particularly Stan. And um, I don't know. I you know Stan is a very bright guy. He's done a lot of good things, and I respect him. But I just wish that he would you know, be more willing to acknowledge as all of us have to as mature adults that we can indeed be mistaken, even about things we feel strongly about. And I've certainly been wrong many times <laughs> yeah. in my life and you follow me, me elsewhere. And we just have to finally say, as you said, one of you said earlier that, you know, just say, okay, I, w- I was mistaken. Let's move on now. Well, I had to do that with the San Luis Valley crystal skull uh, hoax mm-hmm. that I ended up debunking. Uh, and, and actually, uh, gleefully so. I think uh, we need more people out there debunking themselves and, and being super hypercritical about their work and, and their thinking. I think it's very important. I think there's some special satisfaction in being able to debunk something that you yourself originally advocated. It right before somebody well else to, does. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it speaks well to your intellectual integrity. 